about to conduct an interview with Margaret Thompson on July 8, 1994 at the cottage. This is part of the Historical Society's Remembering World War II project. First of all, uh, I know that you're not from Hastings, but your husband was, mm. John Robert Thompson. Right. And he lived where? 88 Fairmont. 88 he, Fairmont. When he went in the service. Mm -hmm. but, was that where he grew up? Yeah, uh, he came to Hastings from Albany at the age of two. Oh. And he was born in 1924, so. I see. Um, tell me a little about about his family. All right. His father was Reuben R. Thompson, uh, the second, and he worked for <clears throat> Lockwood Trade Journal Company in New York. And uh, John's uh, John's mother died when he was in high school. There hmm. were two sons uh, of Reuben the uh, second. John was one, and his brother. Reuben. Was Reuben older or younger? Reuben was, uh, he was six months older than I am. Probably born in 1922. So he was the oldest son. Well, I guess that would figure because they would name the first son after the father. Right. So he was Reuben R. Thompson III. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the uh, boys went to high school here? They both are Hastings High School graduates and uh, <clears throat> I don't know when Reuben went to NYU, but they both went to NYU, but it took my husband 16 years to graduate. At first, he was a pre-med student, and uh, he was there, as far as I know, in 1942, uh, working evenings in the city as an accountant. Now, when the war came along, he was, he applied to the American Field Service, mm -hmm. and they were to be drivers, I think, in North Africa, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but then he also applied to the Navy Naval Aviation Cadet Program, and he got into that in 22 September 42. But he was discharged because they said you're too thin. He was six uh -huh. foot four, and uh, he weighed 136 pounds. So <laughs> they didn't think he was healthy, but uh, some years later. I never heard of that, of anybody being uh, disqualified because he was oh, too thin. Oh, the Navy thin. was very, very picky. Oh, my goodness. Very picky. Well, why did the, uh, how about uh, the American Field Service? Uh, <clears throat> He didn't, he didn't go into that because he, he got accepted to the Naval Aviation Cadet Program, and he was in that from September 42 to 8 February 43. But they let him out because they said, you are too thin. <laughs> so then he went to Army basic training, and I do not remember the name of the basic training camp, but it was way out on Long Island. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that would have been. So he, John took his basic there in April of 1943. And he was sent to Louisiana as a military policeman. And <clears throat> it was a prisoner of war camp. And in my talking, I don't know, do you have that thing turned on now? Or? Yes. Okay. In my talking to you about <clears throat> all of us, I want to show you the difference in the way that the Americans treated their prisoners and the way the Germans treated their prisoners. So they were German prisoners down These there? These were German prisoners, and my husband was assigned uh, to, as a guard. And <clears throat> he jokingly tells me that at times, they would switch and let, he'd let the prisoner carry the gun and John, <laughs> John would march, they'd march each other. In other words, the prisoner had no fear about escaping. Where would he go? No place. Mm -hmm. So they were friends. Where did they uh, 
where had they been captured? Were they the all prisoners, captured in one place, or the did they come from all I over? I have no idea. Uh, we had prisoners at Fort Oglethorpe when I was in the Women's Army Corps, and a truck of, truckload of them went by our mess hall just as one of our girls had fallen into the the garbage trap. She fell in, <laughs> and he got off the truck and got her out. So. Oh. Uh, that was in Georgia? That was a friendly act, yes, Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. Uh, and by contrast, my brother-in-law, Ruben R. Thompson, as a uh, prisoner of war in Germany, was marched almost all the way across Germany, for one, in bitter, bitter cold winter. Uh, he was captured at Bastogne, and... Uh, Would that have been in the winter of 45? Uh, 40, 44, 45? Ruben was captured in 1944, and he spent four and a half years as a prisoner of war, four and a half months as a prisoner of war. Mm. And but where, where did he end up? The things that Ruben remembers most about being a prisoner was the terrible, terrible cold, the lack of food, and picking lice off one another. Huh. And uh, he said that he caught dysentery there, which lasted for 50 years, which uh, was not the serious kind, to quote him. So I don't know. Anyway, oh, it was terrible. not a healthy situation. No. As opposed to the way we fed ours and took care of ours. Mm -hmm. Where did he end up, do you know? Uh, <clears throat> in four and a half months, he said, then I came home. This was Reuben now. But... I don't know if you want me to go to John or to... to well, Ruben. keep going with Reuben. Well, I was talking about John at first. So oh, let's well. see. All right. You were contrasting the way the, the prisoners, prisoners of war were treated. Mm -hmm. uh, was he liberated by uh, the Russians, the uh, English, the French? I do not know. I don't know. He got out of the prison camp in four and a half months after he was captured. He was captured in 1944. Reuben served for eight and a third years of active duty, but he's, he had a total of 14 years by the time he finally got out of the Army. Um, he started as a draftee in, 19, in July of 42. Um, and he says he got out in 1946. He went to NYU. And uh, in 48 and 49, uh, he went to Okinawa. Uh, when he finally was discharged the fall of 53, he was a captain. And brotherly jealousy, I believe, Reuben said, I was a captain for four years before I was discharged. He said, John may have been a major, but he was promoted when he was discharged. So oh. Reuben is telling us that <laughs> <laughs> he became a captain before his brother. And even after Reuben uh, got out of the Army, he served some time as uh, National Guard, and they would not <clears throat> take him as an officer. He served as a sergeant. Did he go back into the uh, Army voluntarily? Oh, yeah. He said uh -huh. he loved the Army, and uh, he still doesn't really know why he went out, except that he thought he could make more money on the outside, but he said that is not true. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Particularly in Okinawa, I wouldn't think there were many opportunities to... Well, I know that, that uh, Reuben was at Fort Totten, he, and his, he had just gotten married, and he and his wife were there when my husband and I were called up for the Korean War. And uh. My husband and I were sent with our unit to Fort Lewis, Washington. Do you, uh, this is in 1950. Now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know if any other boys from Hastings were prisoners of war? Not from Hastings, no. No. A boy that I went with in... Uh, College was a prisoner of war. But he wasn't from Hastings, of course. No, he no. was captured in the Battle of the Bulge. Hmm. And he had a hard time of it, too. Oh, I'm sure any of the 
anybody who had to be in uh, Germany or Italy or any of those uh, countries would have had a very rough time of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was ju just curious if any other Hastings service people were captured. Uh, not that I know of. He didn't mention anyone. Okay, well, now we can go back to John. So you left him in Louisiana, marching with German prisoners of, oh, yes. of war. <laughs> and uh, again, with John's army career, I find that he was a pre-med student, so eventually he ended up as a medical administrative officer. But this is back when he was a private and a military policeman. But the jobs that he held in the Army were <laughs> multi-millions. He was um, even an assistant trial advocate in, uh, at one point. He was, he was assigned as a veterinarian in a three-man detachment. Uh, the veterinarians, My goodness. they handle eggs. They check on the quality of food, I guess. Oh. I don't know if to see whether the egg, the chicken is pregnant or what, but why they kindle them, I don't know. You'd have to ask a veterinarian. Hmm. But I'll <laughs> have to try to remember to ask my niece, my goddaughter. She's a vet. That what? was one of his duties. Um, well, did you say that he enlisted, or he was was he drafted? Uh. I'm not sure about John. I know that Reuben was drafted. John, I think, joined. Did, uh, because he was in the aviation cadet program, but then he went into to the Army. All of us wanted to go and help in the war effort. So he joined uh, or went to basic training in April of 43. And he was discharged as a corporal on 21 December 44 because he went to officer candidate school and became a second lieutenant on 22 December 44. Mm -hmm. And then did he go have any further war experiences? Did he go overseas? Uh, John eventually went overseas, but he was, after OCS, he was assigned to Rapid City, um, South Dakota, to a hospital. And again, the doctor looked at him, he said, you're too thin, and he sent him to Percy Jones for a physical. <laughs> this is a very thorough Army physical, and they could not find anything wrong with my husband. It's just that he is very tall and very thin. So oh my goodness. I never uh, thought of thinness as being a no. physical handicap. Okay, um, while John was in Rapid City, uh, he went on several <clears throat> flights picking up victims of uh, air crashes in the United States, and he said that they are horrendous. Oh, I can um, imagine. Really, Ugh. literally hamburgers on them. Uh, and I know that John was in Fukuoka in Japan. Now, let's spell that. Uh, let's see. U-K-U-O-K-A, -O -O as far as I know. U-K... F-U-K. F-U-K. U-O-K. U-O-K-A. Kachikawa Air Base. I don't know if that's in Fukuoka or not, but he was there in the Air Force at this point, so he had been in the... <laughs> he certainly was shifted <laughs> around. <laughs> he was going to go on the field service, he got in the Navy, he was in the Army as an MP, he was in the Air Force, uh, he went to Officer Candidate School. His career was varied. But he ended up, at the time when I knew him, as a with what they call an MOS, Military Occupational Specialty Number, MOS. MOS, Medical Administrative Officer. That was his MOS. Hmm. Now, so he served throughout World War II. 
1942. Mm -hmm. Was 43. he three? Where was he at the end? At the end of the 42. war. Uh, well, he, was he in he Japan? Had, he talks about uh, attending the uh, Japanese war crime trials over there, and oh, did MacArthur he? was there in Japan at the time. Yeah. Well, let's see. Now, Japan surrendered in in uh, August of forty five. Mm -hmm. So he stayed on after that. DJ Day. Right. Now, I'm sorry, but I do not know the exact date that he returned because uh, John stayed in the army. It says that. Uh, Officers Reserve Corps from 22 December 44 to 10 August 48. That would be active duty. And we all were put on a reserve status at that point. When you left the Army formally, yeah. then you went into the reserve. But as reservists, we had responsibility to attend reserve meetings and to spend two weeks in the summer at Pine Camp mm -hmm. for these people of this area. And so we were up there for training. And, uh, so uh, we were, our unit, uh, he was put into my unit as a reservist in August of uh, 1950. And when we were alerted to go to Korea. Mm -hmm. And one month later, 3 September, we left to go to Korea. We were in a hurry to get there. But we spent 14 months at Fort Lewis, Washington, <laughs> waiting to go. So I don't know where you want that, though, for World War II. Well, it continues the story. All right. Well, I met my husband at uh, one of the reserve meetings in, 19, in August of 1950 when he was put in our unit. That's where we met. Mm -hmm. OK, now let's backtrack a little. and. Tell me about um, how you got into the Army. Okay. Uh, well, I was a graduate of Russell Sage College, physical education major, and we all wanted to go into the service and especially into the waves because the uniforms were beautiful and we knew <laughs> <laughs> this was all glamour plus we could help if we got mm -hmm. yeah. I applied, but as I told you, I too was rejected. I told you the reason. Oh I'm yes. I'm to put it on tape. Mm -hmm. Nothing serious, but hilarious. And uh, so, all right. I didn't get into the Navy, but my father made me use my training. He said you have to teach, so I took a job in. Brooklyn as a YWCA swimming and gymnastics teacher. And at noon one day, I <clears throat> went down and saw the ladies from my reducing class down eating pile of mud and everything else. And I said, where am I getting to? And I went home for lunch and I heard the radio recruiting physical, uh, physical education people and nurses to come into the Army to train to be physical therapists. And I ran all the way down to the recruiting office at that point. And that was in 1944, mm -hmm. August 44. I went to basic training at Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, and spent eight weeks there, where I told you I learned to do eight push-ups after <laughs> four years of physical education could only do two. <laughs> From a hillbilly who was assigned as our physical education person to teach us. But she did not know the term. She would say, pull in your abominables. <laughs> <laughs> she had three of us physical education graduates laughing at her. But she made us work. Now, the Women's Army Corps uh, was relatively new. It had just be changed over from the WAAC, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, 
to be the Women's Army Corps, WAC. So that was the, the WAC. Mm -hmm. At first they were the WAAC. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Because hmm. my father's secretary was a WAAC. Hmm. When, when did that happen? Do you remember? No, but... Uh, During the war? Oh yes, during the war. Yeah. No, I, I don't. I don't remember that. I don't know. Well, Cassie was my father's secretary. Joined, and uh, she went through basic. Mm -hmm. Well, where where were you sent then after the basic training? Well, we were promised when we signed up that we would be assigned to physical therapy school, but there was really never any guarantee. You're, you're when we went to staging from, after eight weeks of basic, they send you to the other side of the uh, camp to wait for your assignment. And some of the girls would be sent to Cooks and Bakers School and you know, all the various jobs that WAX were assigned to, but we got it. We you did? to physical therapy school at Lawson General Hospital in Atlanta. Lawson? Lawson. General Hospital in Atlanta um, and began our training in August of 44 and um, we went to school for this was a special army course which today would seem abbreviated but it was so concentrated we went from 8.30 in the morning until 4.30 at night uh, in the evening, and then went right home and studied. We could not date, we couldn't go anywhere. We had to concentrate on what we were doing because... Even on weekends? Uh, six days a week we were in class. Mm -hmm. So, and we got good training because our patients were the patients from North Africa, from Italy, from the worst patients were flown right here, right over here. Is that so? And they landed at the airport right behind Boston General Hospital. So they'd come overhead and land and then we'd see them. Yes, I'm so sure there was a great need for physical therapists. Mm -hmm. However, um, our hopes to go overseas were dashed because they had already graduated. Ours was class three. They had already graduated two classes. And by the time we graduated, they had enough overseas, so we spent our um, officer time in Army General Hospitals in the United States. I stayed at uh, Lawson General Hospital after graduation uh, for a while, and then I went to McGuire General Hospital in Richmond. Which hospital? McGuire. McGuire. In, in Richmond, Virginia. And then to the station hospital at Fort Belvoir, which Where was, was a that? much smaller installation across the river from Washington, D.C., Fort oh. Belvoir. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our <clears throat> patients varied. I mean, you had serious burns, very bad fractures, you had amputees, you had head injuries, you had uh, Nerve injuries, burns, if I mentioned that, uh, anything you could think of. But, and the stories that the men could tell us were, it showed their wonderful sense of humor, as I mentioned before. Uh, the first amputee we saw who had just received his legs, he was very proud. He had bilateral amputee. We asked him, how were you hurt? Captain, he said, well, I was in command of my men. I was leading my men into battle. And he said, uh, they gave the order to retreat. And he said, I ran all the way back to the United States and ran my legs right down to nubs. <laughs> <laughs> the sense of humor is uh, to a non-initiated person is gory, but that was... Well, I suppose that's how they kept their spirits up. Yeah. How big a, how many men did you have at a time? Oh, good you mean as pa a patient load during the time? Yes. 
I would say maybe 30 some odd. I don't know. Really, that many? Yeah. Oh, our clinic was huge. I mean, we had 20, 30. We had a whole bunch of students in there, and we had uh, staff, physical therapists. Um, great big. The size of an army ward, the clinic was. And most everyone got heat, massage, and exercise of some type. It might have been water, whirlpool, it might have been paraffin heat, um, <clears throat> it might have been a heat lamp, uh, it might have been ultraviolet lamp, um, and a massage, of course, and then, um, well, physical, it, we ran the whole scope of physical therapy, that's all I can tell you. Well, I suppose and the I, amputees I, had to learn how to use their new limbs. I found, and I still find, that going back to civilian physical therapy, that my army training was the best. The experience that we got was wonderful. Across the board. Yeah. Eventually, uh, my friend and I, Barbara <coughs> Grant, a Russell, Russell Sage graduate too, and I, after the war, took a job at Duke University in, uh, in 1946, I think. And we were going to be instructors in the physical school of physical therapy. And we knew more than <laughs> about nerve injuries, things like that, electrical stimulation, motor points. Our experience was good. Well, were you, uh, you said how your training was the best. Were you trained by Army personnel? We were trained by doctors who were brought into the Army. Uh, for, for instance, we had a, I guess this one, our, our anatomy teacher was a Harvard professor who also was a drunk. <laughs> and weekends he was totally out of it. But he'd come down the hill on a motorcycle, around the corner with his notebook, and over to the hospital to teach us. And one morning he tipped over in the mud. His notes all went. And that man could teach us anatomy word for word, right from his mind. I mean, he did not need any notes. Incredible. And uh, very, very good. We had another one who was a psychiatrist that we all always suspected as having gone into it because of his own problems, but he had been a, a psychiatrist in uh, prison in Michigan. And, uh, but he wanted to give us all the Rorschach tests to the girls in the physical therapy class. We took it reluctantly and tongue-in-cheek, and then he said, you can come to my quarters and I'll evaluate us. Well, he was such a weird <laughs> guy that nobody went. Point. So, <laughs> yes, I can imagine. Nobody went to see that one. Um, anyway, I don't know. let's see. Well, I was curious about the training because um, I had a number of older friends who, uh, I was trying to name it, Remember the name of the school in Boston where they got their training? Does Beauvoir sound right? Bouvet. Bouvet. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. That was one. Um, well, that's where um, my classmates. From that's Hudson. where where Marjorie uh, got hers. Um, oh, I'm thinking of the the gal we were talking about. Oh no no my my friend Marjorie uh -huh. Ayanta. Yeah. Um, and she she liked it. Well, and you felt you were helping. Oh, I'm sure you did. As opposed to teaching somebody that would run down and have high all mode. Hi, Mary. Hi. Well, because of, of my my sister was not is an occupational therapist. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't remember, isn't that awful? I can't remember <laughs> where she got her training. Well, many schools. There was one at NYU, of course. No, it was in Boston. Mm -hmm. I'm quite sure. 
she went into the army mm -hmm. as a recreation person uh -huh. and was in Japan. This was not during wartime. Mm -hmm. And so when she came back, she had something, I guess the equivalent of a GI Bill. Oh, yeah. And so she went to um, into uh, occupational therapy. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was, I must have been BU. I wasn't around Washington at the University time. University might have been. I, uh, there were several schools. I know uh, Janet did a class meeting in high school. Uh, went to either Bouvet or the other one. So. Yeah, well, I think it was BU. Uh, as I say, I wasn't around at the time, so mm -hmm. I can't remember. Well, so after you taught at Duke, you were in the reserve at that time? Uh, yeah, I stayed in the reserve. And then you were called up again and uh, for the Korean War, 1950. Mm -hmm. And you served as a occupational uh, physiotherapist there. In the Korean War? Yeah. <laughs> or did they have you baking cakes? Well, I was supposed to be, but I was made. in during one of our training sessions at. Um, Pine Camp, they made me the special service officer for the unit. These are had to do with that MOS number I oh. told you. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any patients. We were a hospital under tents, potentially to go. My duties were to plan the recreation for the unit. And so I got all the information on the golf courses, where this woman was. Uh, we held dances, anything you could mention. We, we set up an officer's club of our own because our commanding officer wanted us to get to know one another, which was the smartest thing he ever did. We could have gone to the officer's club, but we, we took a, a ward size. Um, building, cleaned it up. <laughs> we sent in Izzy, who was very dumb. Izzy was one of our enlisted men to clean the tables. We told him, clean the mess tables off. They're metal. So Izzy gets comet. He sprinkled it all over. He cleaned them all right, but he let it dry. <laughs> they were all blue. <laughs> Anyway, we had a very nice club of our own, and the members of the 320th General Hospital, by the time they were called up, all knew one another very well. Well, I suppose that developed a sort of team spirit yes. and camaraderie. Mm -hmm. It was good. Um, you, that's the second time you mentioned a ward-sized building. Um, could you give me in feet, or well, what, what, what some building around here? A ward would hold 30 patients. 30 patients? Yeah. So, in your beds, maybe well, it would have been at least a hundred feet long then. Oh, pretty long, yeah. Usually, a uh, hospital ward, <clears throat> you would have an entrance hallway which would have a couple of rooms on either side, and then you walk into a an open uh, unit with beds on both sides. Oh, on both sides. About fifteen feet apart running all the way down there, 30 patients in there. And then a day room at the end. Mm -hmm. And I know when I was a student, I was the first day out on the unit. I went out scared to death. I'm 22 years old. I have to go in with all these kids, and they, they love to tease the girls. So I said, where is Corporal Brown? I'm Corporal Brown. I'm Corporal Brown. Well, <laughs> you didn't know what to do. And uh, anyway, as a WAC, we were issued, I don't know if this should go on there or not, underwear, which was um, what they make the stockings out of. Oh, Lyle? Yeah. Anyway, we had a, we had matching slip and drawers, which came down almost to your knees. 
And the fellows on the unit had heard that the wax wore this underwear and they wanted to know what color it was. So the fellow across the ward was, was like this out of his bed trying to see because I'm down on one knee trying to exercise this fellow's leg. And when I found out what he was doing, I blushed a hundred times. And they just teased us like anything. <laughs> if you were out walking in the hall, uh, we were ordered not to talk to the patients at all, not about any personal things, so that we didn't get involved with the, the men. And uh, that was hard because <laughs> they were very friendly. Well, sure, and they wanted and to... And lonesome. Lonesome, too. Yeah. Yes, that must have been difficult to obey. Mm -hmm. Were the uh, were the men back from Korea that you were helping, or were they uh, had they been injured in the United States? Well, the first patients I had as a student were patients from North Africa and Italy and the European War, and then we got them from Japan. From the Pacific. From, I mean, from the um, during the Korean War, when we were sent out to Fort Lewis, I, I hope I'm not confusing you, I must be. Uh, at first, we were assigned, I was assigned special service officer, so I'm planning again the unit recreation. But they decided that we needed to have some time in the hospital, so I got sent over to um, great big general hospital at Fort Lewis to serve there. And our patients there were Korean. They were times. Americans, but wounded in Korea. Mm -hmm. So we had some of each. OK, let me get ask you a few more general questions. When you were uh, in the wax, were, did, were you interested in uh, following the, the war of what was happening abroad? Well, all right, number one, you're, you're not political. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, and you're so busy that you really you didn't have a radio or anything to listen. So our way of following the war was to listen to the patients and to find out where they had been and, and uh, um, phone calls home and so forth. Mm -hmm. and we were aware of what was happening, certainly, but not day to day. For instance, Did my boyfriend, as I told you, was a prisoner of war. He was captured in the Battle of the Bulge and uh, spent quite a while in the German prison camp. So did you, how about movies? There used to be newsreels always uh, before the movie went on. In basic training, we were shown a series of movies called Why We Fight. And uh, they showed the Emperor of Japan and, you know, why. Hitler. Uh, why? Why were we fighting? I thought it was a very good orientation. It, uh, hmm. yeah. And heard about that before. How long a series was it? Mm, several sessions, I guess, we went to. And, uh, because basic training, I mean, you had all kinds of classes all day long. Again, you had how to wear your uniform, <laughs> how to march, <laughs> how to uh, put on gas masks and go through the, the mm. gas chamber. and. Uh, did they drill you a lot? Did you do a lot of drilling? Oh, yes. And I lied about how tall I was. I was five foot seven and six tenths, officially. But I said, I'm five eight. <laughs> because Why? Oh, what was the advantage? <laughs> the advantage was that that way I could carry the guide on, which is the unit to fly. We had 150 girls behind you. But I'm one step out in front, and I'm the one that they have to follow. You don't have oh. to stay in step with them. 
So I was the guy down there for our <laughs> group. <laughs> because I lied about So you, you, um, you established the pace then? Yeah. Well, the, the, uh, your lieutenant or whoever's marching you, of course, really, I mean, you're following that person. One of, one of the women, as I, I mentioned before too, is uh, one of the women we had as a lieutenant would be more comfortable behind a tea table or in a New Yorker cartoon. I mean, she, <laughs> she had no idea how to march anyone. She would march us in the bushes and uh, <laughs> she would say, dress is right, girls, dress is right. Now it's dress like dress. And that oh. is how you line up, you put your hands Oh, yes. And <laughs> oh, so you're uh, arm's dresses. length apart. Yeah. So, but and she, and she said what? Dress is right, girls, dress is right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess she was nice, but uh, she didn't know what she was doing. Well, I wonder where she did her training. When she put us at attention one day, uh, and you're supposed to, uh, there's a con by contrast, you can put your unit at ease when you're marching. And this day it was raining, and I had my army hood on, so I couldn't see left and right, nor could I see her. And so she did with her arm. She pointed where she wanted us to go, but I didn't see her at the fork of the road. I went this way. <laughs> so, and the rest went the other way. Yeah. When did you discover her? Very were? funny times, you know. I hope she had a sense of humor. Yes, she did. Good. <laughs> but overall, I um, enjoyed being in the Army, and I'm glad I didn't get in the Navy because I would have been a misfit. I am, and after, after all, I am an Army brat. My father was a West Pointer, and uh, I was brought up in the Army, and I would have been well, maybe in Maybe the that Navy. Uh, fate. I maybe mean, that helped you adjust? I had no problem adjusting, believe me. You know, I enjoyed every bit of it. Well, now, how about when you, do you remember, um, do you remember VJ Day mm -hmm. and VE Day? Mm -hmm. What was the, can you describe what it was, your feelings that, on hearing? Well, of course, we're very happy. I uh, specifically, no, I can't. All I know is that we, uh, uh, right after VJ Day, we were all, told we could be discharged, and everybody went up to Washington to get discharged. I followed like a lemming. I, I, I love the Army. I don't know why I got out, you know, but <laughs> we all did. And mm. We stayed in the reserve, of course, but... Uh, yeah. So there were people in the Army, in the Women's Army Corps, that were not as reputable nor enjoying themselves as much, I'm sure. Uh, who, in every group, you have people that give a unit a bad name. But on the whole, I think that we can say that every one of the girls that came into the Army were there to help the war effort. They really were. They really came for patriotic yes. reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there was great rejoicing at. Uh, where were you on, on VJ Day? Remember? I, I was at uh, Fort Belvoir. Mm -hmm. I remember it very vividly, VJ Day. I was uh, mm -hmm. at a play in Boston. i have forgotten the name of the play. It was about Robert Schumann. And about the second act, we heard all this noise outside. Mm -hmm. Sirens. Bells ringing, people shouting. We thought it was a fire. Uh -huh. uh, and when the play was over, we went outside, and then we discovered what it was, but we thought it was a, uh, as, as a fire. The streets were just jammed with celebrants. Well, I, to follow... Um, my husband's army career to just, this is after the war now, when he was recalled to, uh, in 1950, 
uh, he was the supply officer for the unit. Now, see, as I told you, the MOS changes. <laughs> so he was put in charge of all of the supplies for a large 320th General Hospital. I brought the picture before you saw the hospital in Landstuhl, yeah. Germany. Well, up until they left Fort Lewis to go to Germany, we were categorized as a hospital under tents. And similar to what you see in MASH, only that would be a small unit. We would have, in fact, we when we set up out there, we had all tents. Mm. We had practice sessions to set up under tents. And uh, so anyway, John's got all this equipment. It's on trains. It's going to Germany, and he is supposed to be the advance party. He sent to New York City to pick it up at Governor's Island to officially sign for it before it went overseas. And he found out that it was in a train wreck coming across the country. <laughs> so he got to stay here. What happened was that we were married in 1951 in January. Uh, and this is October of 51, we came, we both came back to Hastings because he was assigned to Governor's Island to wait for the equipment. But the train wreck delayed it. He got to stay here until the 15th of December with his now then pregnant wife. So that <laughs> <laughs> was wonderful that, you know, we could stay home and live like civilians for a while. So you didn't go overseas with him? I, no, they, they, uh, I was discharged in uh, June, I think, uh, June, no, uh, yeah, officially June of uh, 52, after my daughter was born. Mm -hmm. But um, at the time, you could not stay in the Army if you were pregnant. They can now. Oh, can they? Mm -hmm. But, um, so John got to Korea, or rather got to uh, Europe after all the rest of the unit arrived <laughs> to accept this. He left on the 15th of December of 1950 to fly to Germany. I said goodbye. And he got on a plane and he got out over the ocean get a telephone call. He said, I'm back. This is from Westover Field now. Um, their plane caught fire. And that, Goodness. And that, he just seemed to be jinxed. And so they took off again. And they went out over the ocean and the same thing happened. Another <laughs> So they got back. And they finally got to Reykjavik um, and they were... In Iceland. Yeah, they were supposed to go by where way over near the Caribbean, but I mean near the uh, near Spain that way, but they didn't. They went the northern route, and they had on board some army personnel, wives and children, a baby, uh, going to see their families in Germany for Christmas. You'd think if they left 15th of December, they'd get there for Christmas. They didn't get there till after Christmas. <laughs> Because in Reykjavik, um, they unloaded to de-ice the plane before uh, and they, one of the gal's hand got stuck on the railing going down. They had to unthaw her. Uh, so there was a delay. They get to uh, Scotland, I think it was. And again, they landed in flames. <laughs> <laughs> they just seemed jinxed. Good fact, right. And then they tried three times to go into Germany. Uh, once they landed in Paris by because of weather. Spent a night there and they kept coming back to England. They came to England, they'd go to Scotland and uh, back and forth. And so by the time they finally got to Germany, it was after Christmas. One of the what wives, a tale. One of the wives <laughs> The old saying, if you have time to spare, travel by air. <laughs> um, 
Well, I'm kind of boring. I just. Well, is there anything um, further you'd like to tell me? Uh. Well, so I I spent uh, three and a half years in the army, uh, active duty, and seven and a half years uh, total. Reuben spent eight and a third years active duty, fourteen years um, overall time. My husband from 1942 to 19 well 1954 he was still in the reserve. But, um, about that time he got out. And then uh, when he returned, you made your home here in Hastings. We came to Hastings because, well, John had to let me off because I couldn't go overseas and uh, they wouldn't let me. And uh, so I stayed very fortunately with John's father who was living alone. His mother, John's mother, had mm -hmm. died. And so he was very happy to have me, and we just got along beautifully. Oh, that was good. So, and uh, John came back because my daughter was being born, and also because his father was sick. Mm -hmm. The week that I left for the hospital, his father uh, had serious uh, cancer attack. He went into the hospital mm -hmm. a couple of days before John was, uh, Jamie, my daughter, was born. So. He never saw his grandchild, which was very sad. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. But they let both John and Reuben out. Reuben was in Europe at that time, too. So, he's rough. so you have good memories of being in the wax? Yes. We were commissioned after we Finished, finished physical therapy school, so I got out as a first lieutenant eventually. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.